Hello everyone. Welcome to lecture five, which is the last lecture in this module two, which is on SRAM cells. The disclaimers remain the same. If you look at the SRAM array, what you'll see is in between these bit line and bit line bar. This is bit line. This is bit cell bit line bar. You have several such SRAM cells. So this is your SRAM cell I. We'll have SRAM cell I plus one and so on. However, at the end of this, we'll have something which is called sense amplifier, and also at the top, we'll have something which is called a pre-charge circuit. So let us take them one by one. So what exactly is a pre-charge circuit? So as the name calls, it's used for pre-charging your bit line and bit line bar. During the read process, so how it looks like? The most simple implementation is like this. You have let's say this line as VDD, and then you have this signal as let's call it P charge bar. If your PC is high, like if your P charge is one. Then your PC bar is low, and it will kind of enable these two D MOSFETs to transfer VD like this. This is how your simple, very simple pre-charge circuit looks like. You can do another modification. What you can do is you can connect another P MOS like this over here to this pre-charge mode itself. Now, what this P MOS does is it kind of you know equalizes the voltages at PL and VL bar. You know, this is how your very simple pre-charge circuit looks like. Now, let us look at the other component, which is your sense amplifier. So, first of all, the question arises: Why do we need a sense amplifier? So, during the read operation, what happens is you kind of pre-charge both of them to VDD. You pre-charge this to VDD. Pre-charge this to VDD. And then what you do? If you have like a Q bar equals to zero or Q equals to zero, correspondingly, the node potential here or here will discharge. Let's say when you have Q bar equals to zero, the node potential here at BBL. Sorry, this has to be BBL bar, and this has to be BBL line. The nomenclature is something that you know it doesn't matter really. So if this is BDD and this is Q bar equals to zero, so this Capacitor over here, which is again a combination of input capacitance of this, input capacitance of this, and all the uh, you know CGDs of all the stem cells, and also the interconnects. So this will kind of be discharged towards ground through this end MOS of this inverter. Or if it is, if it, if the case is for, let's say, Q equals to zero, then this node will be discharged to ground by this end MOS. Regardless of the case, in both the cases, what you have is these two capacitances are discharged through this N MOS towards ground. However, this bit line capacitance is large, as I told that it's in some picofarad range. And if it is just being discharged by a single N MOS transistor, it will take a lot of time. So, what the sense amplifier does is it simply accelerates the read operation. How it does that? Sense amplifier is nothing but an amplifier. So if you have any small, you know, voltage swing at the input of an amplifier, what you'll have is at the output you'll have a large output swing, and you can achieve ground or the rail in a very small time. So you know, simply. Changes any small amount of change in your bit line or bit line bar to a large amount of change and discharges it close to like very fast to ground. So, what's the aim of this sense amplifier? First of all, is it necessary? I mean, the first question if I ask you, is it mandatory to use a sense amplifier in a SRAM cell? No.
anyhow this load cap load capacitor will be discharged to the ground but just to you know accelerate just to have a large speed just to accelerate this process we need a sense amplifier now what are the common types of sense amplifier that people use or you know uh, what are how can we actually realize a sense amplifier so the most common form of sense amplifier that people use is a differential amplifier is sense amplifier so i guess you must have gone through this differential amplifier in your analog circuits course so what exactly is a differential amplifier you have two inputs coming to it and the output is kind of amplified version of the difference between the two inputs now let us look at one of the most common used uh, i would say differential amplifier which is differential amplifier based on current mirrors so let me draw the circuitry first and why do we go for it because it has got a very high cmr i mean i won't get into the details of how exactly the cmr is high and how exactly this uh, you know sense amplifier is designed or something i'll just give you a brief overview of how exactly it works that should be enough for this course so you have these two pmos arranged in the form of uh, you know a current mirror structure why how we uh, make it a current mirror we just connect it straight to the grid straight to the source actually sorry uh, get to the drain itself straight into so how does this act like a current mirror or what exactly is a current mirror so current mirror what it does is it simply you know copies the current from one branch to the other and how it does that since you have this vds and you know since you have vds and you know the vgs of these two transistors let's call them transistors m3 and m4 if you have this vgs and vds of both these transistors equal you have same current going through them so that is how this acts like a current mirror and this connection of this uh, drain to gate makes this m3 in diode connected form and you know uh, this ensures that this m3 is always in saturation okay with this let me draw the bottom part which is kind of a differential pair thing so let me draw a differential pair now so we have two mos one let's say m1 and then we have this m2 These are known as differential pairs because we apply input to this M1 and M2, and at the bottom let's have this M5, and we connect it to a signal which is called sense. So the moment your sense is high, this differential amplifier will start working. So how basically a differential amplifier works is: let us say your BL is connected here and BL bar is connected here. Now. if you know these are matched i mean if your m1 is matched to m2 then what happens is let us say a current iss flows through it so if a current that is flowing through this node is iss and if m1 is matched to m2 and you know m3 is also matched to m4 so same current i mean the current that is flowing through this im3 or im1 will be same as the current that flows through im4 and im2 and how uh, what will be the value of that current so that im1 equals to im3 equals to im4 equals to im2 will be equals to iss by 2 in that case right this is the case when you know both these terminals have equal voltages and you know uh, these are matched matched transistors As long as the BL voltage is equal to the BL bar voltage, we don't have any problem. Now, during the read operation, what may happen is the voltage at BL or BL bar may reduce by let's say del V BL. So let's say uh, our Q was equal to zero in some SRAM cell, and somehow it kind of started sinking the voltage at this V BL through its N MOS, and now the drop in the voltage is del vvm now if this voltage is dropping what will happen so if this voltage is dropping what will happen is the overdrive voltage of this m1 let's call this voe1 that reduces that reduces by an amount which is del vvm correspondingly the current through this m1 will reduce so im1 will now reduce below iss by 2 and let us call this im1 as iss by 
minus what? Minus let's say del I M one, which is the kind of reduction in the current because of this voltage reduction by del V B L. Now since this current is actually copied to this, since this current is since M three is in series with this M one, the same current flows in M three. So your I M three is equal to I M one. And now the same current will be copied to this I M four because of this current mirror structure that we have here. So because of this current mirror structure, which is here, the same current will flow through M four. So okay, that will be equal to I M four as well. I missed an important component by drawing, which was this output motor, where we actually take the output. So initially. When there was DL equals to DL bar, I mean the voltage of DL and DL bar are same, and all the transistors are kind of matched. We have I one, I M one equals to I M three equals to I M four equals to I M two. Therefore, the current going out or coming inside because of this kind of you know because of this uh, out of this node that would be zero initially. But now that we have applied our we have started our read operation, and you know uh, your DL voltage has dropped by del V B L. You have a drop in M one current. And similarly, you have a drop in M3 current, and you also have a drop in the M4 current. Now, if you focus through the current on IM2, your current through IM1 plus current through IM2 must be equal to ISS, because we are not changing kind of this current which flows through M5. So now, what happens is your IM2 now becomes ISS minus IM1, which is equals to ISS minus ISS by two. Plus this del I M one, right? So now your current that flows out, or your current at the output, is equals to I M four minus this I M two, right? So since your current is I M four minus I M two, your I M four is same as your I M three and I M one, which is I S S by two minus of del I M one. And then you have to subtract from here what ISS by two minus this del of I M one. So if you do the calculation, it becomes minus two times del I M one. So initially, the current that was flowing or that is coming inside, the direction of the current is only different. It's kind of coming inside. The direction or initially when your V B L was equal to V B L bar, no current was actually flowing at the output. But now, because of this uh, drop of this PVL, what is happening is you have a current which is coming from the output, and the magnitude of that current is twice of the change in the current of M1. So if you say you have your inverter or any kind of circuit here at your output terminal, then you know it's uh, you know uh, what should I say? There, if there is a capacitor over here, its voltage will reduce, and let's say the inverter will flip. So it could be something like that. So you know, this way you can actually you know work your uh, differential work with your differential amplifier, and you can actually tune. You can have a large change in your output, even when the smallest uh, even when your input is changing by a very small amount. So this was just a case of very simple differential amplifier. You can have a configuration of sense amplifier where you have multiple stages of this differential amplifier. You can have also static latches based this sense amplifier. So now one of the you know very uh, primitive kind of you know sense amplifier is this, where you have this bit line and then bit line bar, and instead you have just this cross coupled inverter pair. So this is your sense. You have this cross coupled inverter pair over here. So let's say you have something like this. You have this connected to bit line and bit line bar, and then you have again a sense. Control signal. Okay. This is VDD. This is sorry. This is VDD. This is ground. So here, what happens is, the moment the difference between this PL and PL bar increases, this kind of flips the positive feedback of this bistable element comes into picture and flips flips the content, and so you have like your PL bar going from zero to one. Now this kind of completes the discussion on 60s stamp cell. now what i would like to talk about is something which is more research oriented and i would say that it's something which is very common nowadays and that is your non volatile stamp 
So we discussed initially by classifying our memories as volatile or not volatile that your SRAM is a volatile memory. So what this means is your data is lost as soon as you power off your SM bank. So that was what we discussed in the first lecture itself. Now, why do we need to power off this SM bank? So many times with the help of power gating to conserve your battery life, what we do is you turn off your cores in a multi-core system and when you want to go into the deep sleep state, you also turn off your I2 cache, right? Remember our discussion from the second lecture that we can also turn off our I2 cache just to save some uh, energy and save some battery life. However, the problem that we found was, so I2 cache, as you can recall, it's also made up of instant cells. However, the problem with this approach was the moment we want to, you know, uh, wake up, the wake up time is large. And why so? Because, you know, now you have to bring the data from main memory back to the L2 cache. And this adds to the latency. So this is what happens. So to just mitigate this kind of problem, I mean, just to improve the performance of this system, just to introduce, you know, uh, just so that you don't have to go back to the main memory to fetch the data. What people proposed was, let us make this SRAM as non-volatile. So if it is non-volatile, it can actually store the states even when it is powered on. And when you just power on, it takes the states and without even fetching the main memory, you know, you can make up. So that's the benefit of this. So how people are proposing this? So let me take the case of Cypress semiconductors. So what Cypress proposed was, we have this usual SRAM cell. Sorry. You have these access transistors M5, M6. You have these cross to cross couple converters one and two. So what Cypress semiconductor is kind of doing also, and what they proposed was, the moment you write to this SRAM cell, Q equals to one and Q equals to zero, you also connect this node to two other cells, which are not volatile but non-volatile, and in that in their case, it's Sonos memory. So it's a kind of flash memory. I'll discuss about Sonos in an additional module. So what they do is, the kind of, the moment they write the data to a cell, they also write it to two different cells. Let's call this Sonos memory one, Sonos memory two. They are kind of flash memories. Based on, you know, charge trap technology. Charge trap technology. So here they store the charges in the gate of gate stack in a silicon nitride layer. So these are known as Sonos. Anyways, I'll discuss about them later, but at the moment, what you should understand is what Cypress proposed was the moment you write a data to any SNAP cell, like parallelly or at the same time, you write this data into some non-volatile memory. And the most common non-volatile memory that you have is flash memory. So you write Q equals, Q equals to zero here, and you also program this S1 to zero state, and you program this S2 to one state at the same time. Now, even if you power it off, the values are stored in this flash memory, which are non-volatile. And the moment you wake, like the moment you wake them up, wake, uh, wake them up, you just get this data from this local, a uh, local non-volatile memory which is very adjacent to this SRAM cell, rather than going to the main memory, that is your DRAM and fetching it back. So this way, they were trying to, you know, improve your wake up time speed. However, they ran into several problems. 
So let me discuss the problems. So first problem was the supply voltage of flash or the voltage that flash requires to program the relays are in excess of eight volts. However, your SRAM, you know, they are kind of made with uh, the lowest possible technology modes or the most advanced technology modes because you want to reduce the size. So in the advanced technology nodes, your VDT is also scaled and it's close to 0.7. So if you want to have eight volts on the same chip, you'll have to have another power supply, right? So there would be additional loading complexity and all. And the second problem that they faced was, although your logic technology nodes, logic technology has reached five nanometer and it is going to reach three nanometer soon, but your flash technology, especially this Sonos, has not scaled that rapidly. So it's still at 14 nanometer. So the development of this flash technology has to be hand in hand with logic technology in order to sustain this kind of architecture. And again, another problem that you may like infer on your own, density, right? So here also you have like eight transistors now. If you consider Sonos or Flash maybe as one transistor, you also have eight transistors. So what Maxim proposed, so what Maxim proposed that we don't use any storage element. Instead what we do is we kind of have a lithium ion battery, which is close to each cell, close to your SRAM cells. So the moment your external supply somehow gets erupted or you know your external supply fails, the switch to this local battery for power supply. But this is also not very feasible. But they implemented this and they came up with this. Anyways, so why we are discussing this non-volatile SMS? Because this is somewhere the emerging non-volatile memory technologies would be very uh, efficient, I would say. So if you replace your flash or Sonos with emerging non-volatile memories, what are the advantages that you can get? First, your emerging non-volatile memories have an operating voltage, which is less than eight volts. So you can work close to your logic supply voltages as well. Second, The access speed of your EMEMs is in some nanosecond. And for flash, your access speed is in some microseconds. So even the access speed will improve, and as such, your timing that it requires for our waking up that will also reduce. Third advantage that you get is most of these emerging non-volatile memory are two terminal devices. So the area that they take is 4F square. If you remember our discussion on this area and all. So uh, we saw how basically they are arranged in a cross bar fashion. And you know the area that one memory cell takes up is only 4F square, which is very low as compared to, you know, a transistor area. So transistor area is always greater than 4F squared. The least can, that it can be is 6F squared. So anyways, so you also gain in terms of area. So you also have an area benefit or a density benefit. So this is an area where, you know, the emerging non-volatile memories have been exploited a lot. And you can expect to see some non-volatile SRAMs based on these emerging non-volatile technologies very soon. So this kind of finishes off, you know, our, uh, SRAM module. And with this, uh, I'll post the assignment today itself. And you'll have to submit it on Sunday as we discussed. I mean, I'll write all the instructions there. Okay, thank you so much.